Hello and welcome. I'm Johan Castell and you're watching We on Wings. Take a look at the stories we have coming up for you on the show today. This year, India is host to the G20, and throughout the year, across the country, there are meetings that draws in delegates from across the world to participate. Now, this week, Kashmir has hosted a tourism summit to attract new visitors to the region. Take a look. Kashmir, an area often called the Switzerland of India due to its snow-capped mountains, pristine Himalayan lakes, lush meadows and tulip gardens. This week, G20 tourism was in the headlines as delegates from the group of 20 countries discussed the scope of tourism in Kashmir. They held a panel discussion during the G20 tourism working group meeting on Monday this week. The meeting from May 22nd to 24th is part of the more than 100 meetings India has scheduled across the country. As the most populous nation on earth hosts the G20 presidency for 2023. India's G20 Sherpa said more than 18 million tourists visited Kashmir in 2022. We had about 18.8 million tourists in 2022, which is the highest ever in the last three decades. Highest ever in 2020. 18 million. We expect this number to keep going up in a very big way. Kashmir tourism officials said 2022 only brought 20,000 foreign visitors. The focus is now on attracting more tourists from Europe to the region. On Tuesday, India's chief coordinator of G20, Harsh Vardhan Shringla, said the union territory of Jammu and Kashmir aims to attain tangible benefits from the tourism working group meeting. Whether it is tourism, whether it is support, and a market uh, for uh, the handicraft products, uh, the famous handicraft products of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, whether it is uh, in terms of uh, showcasing the best that we have of the state of the Union Territory, I think that is something that will be very, very tangible benefits. India's G20 Sherpa Amitabh Kant said the response to the meeting was overwhelming, with 60 foreign delegates participating. Representatives from different countries could be seen touring around Srinagar and the scenic Dal Lake with its illuminated houseboats at dusk. The G20 uh, tourist group celebrating here in Kashmir is a perfect occasion just to uh, use tourism as a tool, as a tool for uniting people, uh, as a tool for peace, as a tool for prosperity. The High Commissioner of Singapore in India, Simon Wong Vie Quinn, was touched by the Kashmir hospitality during the visit. We have seen many beautiful sites in Srinagar. We are very touched uh, by the hospitality uh, of citizens in Srinagar. Uh, we are very, very thankful for this opportunity. Not just him, other delegates had also had a fantastic time in the Switzerland of India, Kashmir. I'm sure it will, from what I have seen today, the areas that they want to promote, to many areas that we highlighted today we concerned to Kashmir tourism. I'm sure in the future their tourism will promote even more than it is. And I hold the same for my country too. When we check in with Amitabh Kant, he thinks this meeting will open doors. Do you think this is a starting point holding G20 meeting here for the Kashmir tourism to grow? I think this will open the doors for many more filmmakers to come. This will open the door for Kashmir as a great MICE destination, which is for meetings, incentives, conventions and exhibitions. This will open the door for many high-value tourists to come here. This will open the doors for many private sector investors to come to Kashmir. Thank you very much for speaking to us with video journalist Feroz Idri Sloan for Beyond World is One. From a tourism summit to one of the most unique stories in Kashmir, the floating vegetable market on Dal Lake is a must-see for visitors to this vibrant Union territory. And we went to check it out to take some photos. 
take a look. We are on the way to one of India's most unique wholesale vegetable markets, on the back channels of the famous Dal Lake in Kashmir. This is where farmers bring their fresh produce in the wee hours of the morning. I've tied up with one of them to take me to the market and see how it functions. The lake is dotted with small houseboats. There are even shops selling all kinds of goods right on the lake. As we approach the floating market, the sky starts catching the first light of dawn. Although the market is one of the largest of its kind in Asia, it's not the only one. Thailand also has a floating vegetable market, which is also quite popular. But what really sets this floating market apart is the ecosystem of this wetland. It is terrific for producing vegetables like tomatoes, cucumbers, all kinds of gourds and of course the famous nadru or lotus roots, a local delicacy. Most of the vegetables for sale at Dal Lake's floating market are grown on the lake itself and these are retrieved just hours before being sold. These floating gardens are detached from the bottom of the lake. It is a unique feature of the lake and constitutes roots of lilies that make the landmass float. These uh, gardens can also be moved around. Around 1250 acres of land along the Dal is being used for the cultivation of vegetables. Locals say that more than 6,000 families depend on these floating gardens. Everything that is grown here is fully organic, I'm told. This market has been operational for over a century and is only running in the summer months of the year. Some boatmen uh, paddle for several kilometers each day to go and come back from the market. They bring their produce uh, from their floating gardens and once they are finished buying and selling, they proceed to sell these vegetables in different shops around Srinagar. What an experience! This one I think I will be narrating to my grandchildren someday. Moving on to Southeast Europe now, the Bulgarian capital Sofia was illuminated by works from different artists from across the world while hosting the Lunar Festival of Lights earlier this month. Take a look. Bulgaria's capital Sofia has a cultural significance in Southeast Europe. Known for its national opera and ballet of Bulgaria, along with the National Palace of Culture, Ivan Vazov National Theatre, National Archaeological Museum and the Serdika Amphitheatre. This Eastern European capital with Roman Empire roots is a cultural hub in the region. During the recent Lunar Festival of Lights, the city's National Palace of Culture had a new look after being lit up as a part of an art installation. Around 30 artists' works were projected onto buildings at night, illuminating the nights in spectacular fashion. Illustrations by Bulgarian artist Tekla Alexieva and international artists from Southeast Asia were included. The show used videos, static projections on buildings and light installations also featured an interactive light painting studio and a light parade. Lunar is a festival of light art. This is its second edition. It combines various forms of art such as static images, animations, 2D, 3D as well as sculptural works, hand painted works. It is home to a wide variety of arts. It's like a canvas, a gallery for a variety of artists in the open air. Besides lit up buildings, performers in costumes stage a parade. An underpass in Sofia was also decorated and lit by UV lights for the occasion, with a massive mural over 60 meters long, titled Into the Whirlwind of the City. Our work fits into the Lunar Festival with the light experience that happens when you enter this underpass. We did an extremely long mural 
using fluorescent paints. The idea is to illuminate certain points of the city through art, make the underpass a surprising, magical place that will take you to another space. For some of the artists involved, the focus is on improving the personal responsibility of citizens in everyday behavior by emphasizing the environment, which left a strong impression on spectators. I liked the environmental messages in the light shows. They made a strong impression on me to save the Earth. Our planet is the only wealth we have, and this light work show gives us a lot to think about. We've all heard of the seven wonders of the world, and most of us would love to visit a wonder if we're holidaying in a country that is home to one. A British adventurer has now visited all seven wonders of the world in less than seven days breaking a Guinness World Record for the feat while raising money for charity. It is at this moment that Jamie McDonald from the UK achieves a world record as he enters Mexico's ancient Mayan site of Chichen Itza. In only 6 days, 16 hours and 14 minutes, McDonald traveled over 36,700 kilometers to see the new Seven Wonders of the World. Visiting the Seven Wonders of the World is once in a lifetime, right? It is once in a lifetime. Most people wouldn't even see Seven Wonders in, this, in a lifetime and then I was set the challenge to see um, seven in seven days. So. For me, the adventure was right, right there at the forefront to try and break the world record. The list of seven wonders of the world also include the Great Wall of China, Petra in Jordan, India's Taj Mahal, the Colosseum in Rome, Machu Picchu in Peru, and the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro. When McDonald reached India's new wonder of the world, the Taj Mahal, it was an emotional experience, even though it was only a short visit. Wow. Oh my god, that is just... I actually feel quite emotional. I don't think I've ever seen anything as beautiful as that as a building goes. I think I slept 12 hours in the space of seven days. So from that front, it was really challenging. And it was go, 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 non-stop. I think when we saw the Taj Mahal, the taxi driver pulled up, we ran, right, or I ran, and, uh, and then got to, the, got to see the Taj Mahal. Actually, cried uh, because it was such a beautiful building. And, and then we raced back, got back in the taxi, and the taxi driver's like, there's no way you've seen the wonder. We're like, we, I have, I've just seen it. Travelport sponsored McDonald for the challenge, and the British adventurer took 13 flights, 16 taxis, 9 buses, 4 trains and 1 toboggan to make his way around the world. However, not everything went according to plan. At one point, he missed a flight, risking the whole mission. I'm sorry sir, you lost the flight. Uh, are you sure? There's no way of getting me on that no, flight. No, there's no way, unfortunately. I ended up missing a flight, I went to the wrong terminal, uh, but luckily they kind of swooped in and managed to get me on the next flight, and then, of course, then make the next piece of transport after that, otherwise the whole thing could have went under. What adventure is next for Jamie McDonald? What could keep him up for days at a time without sleeping? What could top something as extreme as this? As a father of three children, including twin babies, the next thing it's right at home. <laughs> the good thing is, the twins was like this amazing uh, training for sleep deprivation, ready for the challenge. So it was great training. So I've just got to get back to the twins. I think, you know, that is an adventure in itself. From the wonders of the world to the different heat waves that have struck the northern hemisphere this year. There have been heat wave after heat wave striking different parts of the world from North America to Europe and now India. 
take a look at our report. Heat waves have struck North India many times already this year. February was reported to be the hottest in over 120 years, and heat waves were called for the season. Scientists blame climate change for the events that are now more frequent than before. But the reason for these heat waves can also be increasing urbanization, leading to ever taller buildings and less green cover. The growing use of air conditioners also contributes to the increased heat emitted by cities. The national capital region has had a sweaty start to the week, with some parts of New Delhi seeing temperatures of over 45 degrees Celsius. Not just humans, animals like stray dogs and birds were suffering under the heat wave too. Some non-profits in India provide water, food and shelter to save animals from dehydration. At India's zoos, special arrangements are made to ensure big and small animals can deal with the heat. We are also bathing all the animals in the morning and then we are releasing them out into the arena. So at least they feel uh, the temperatures don't rise immediately. But it is not only in India that the heat has been unbearable this year. Morocco recently suffered a spring heat wave that brought summer temperatures to the country in the middle of spring. Last month, a heat wave struck Spain, bringing temperatures up to nearly 40 degrees Celsius. The heat wave got so bad that a horse pulling a carriage collapsed and died from heat stroke in Sevilla. For the tourists who have made their way here, the solution to dealing with the heat can involve shade and ice cream and maybe even a sangria. Um, walk in the shade, eat ice cream, drink a lot of water. <laughs> See? Yes, yeah, same. We've, we're here. This is our first day in Cordoba, um, and we're trying to stick to the shade when we're out walking about, and really a lot of water and sangria. Oh, yeah, sangria. <laughs> lots of drinks, lots of fluids, um, lots of shade. We just walk on the, on the shady part of the street. <laughs> but um, it's not something we're used to, I guess, but we'll enjoy it while it's here. Earlier this month, the heat struck Seattle, too bringing record temperatures for this time of the year to the city. Some people gathered at public fountains to cool off. And now it's time for the latest news and updates for those who are looking for the best experiences in the world of travel, tourism and aviation. Take a look at our news deck. Archaeologists in northern Peru have made a significant discovery. Uncovering the tomb of a prominent leader from the Chancay culture, a pre-Inca civilization. The tomb was found buried at a depth of 7 meters at the Makaton funerary archaeological site in the province of Huaral, approximately 75 kilometers north of Lima. The excavation took two months and revealed the resting place of an elite figure. The tomb's impressive dimensions, seven meters deep and wide, makes it the largest burial found in the roughly 50-acre site. The Mazaton Curaca was likely involved in fishing activities, as indicated by the presence of a wooden oar within the tomb. Five other individuals, including adults and children, were also discovered, and large ceramic vessels adorned with animal figures and the remains of four llamas. These vessels, colored in shades of brown and cream, contained offerings of fish, corn and guinea pigs, symbolizing the Chankai belief in the continuation of life after death. Ahead of International Biodiversity Day, individuals from Brazil's Sao Paulo took a trip to a reforested area in Ito City, located 100 kilometers away in the Atlantic Forest. An old farm has transformed into a forestry experiment center, where the visitors learned about the various challenges this biodiverse biome faces. The group also explored the Centris Nursery, which can produce 750,000 seedlings annually of over a hundred species native to this forest. 
The Atlantic forest spans 17 Brazilian states and is one of Earth's most biologically diverse regions. Home to most of Brazil's population, it has suffered significant devastation, and only 24% of its original forest remains. Among the visitors was Laura Coraline, a five-year-old who expressed excitement after planting her fruit tree. Her mother, Carolina Coraline, believes fostering a stronger connection between people and nature has the potential for a brighter future. As nations around the globe celebrated World Biodiversity Day this Monday, people are being reminded of the pledges they have made to save our environment. There are some areas of concern where conservationists work. The Mayan train in Mexico's Yucatan is intended to drive economic development and boost tourism in one of Mexico's poorest areas. Still, environmentalists are concerned that the project will hurt ecosystems nearby. Underwater habitats are being lost to human development and overfishing too. In the Bahamas, conservationists are working to save the conch that is central to the identity of the island. In Senegal, overfishing has made the white grouper disappear as humans compete with wildlife. A battle in which the natural world is often losing. At the conference in Canada's Montreal last December, agreements were made for conservation efforts of a third of the world's lands, oceans and coastal waters. Biodiversity Day shines a light on these sensitive issues, and hopefully this will work to prevent further loss of species and habitats. Well, that's all we have for you in this week's episode of We on Wings. But check out next week's episode for the latest updates from the world of travel, tourism and aviation. For now, it's me, Johan Castell, checking out. Thank you.